pick the wrong weight and quit sniffing glue. Enterprise, this is the Galileo. Come in, please. I may be homely, Buster, but I'm S-M-A-R-T smart. Welcome, people. This is going to be one of those potpourri weeks. Uh, as you can hear by the uh, constant hum in the background of the fan blowing. I recently got into 3D printing and I, I'm going to make the disclaimer. This is not going to be a, a channel about 3D printing. Forget it. There are plenty of other more qualified, way more qualified people than me out there. But this is going to be uh, an adjunct to my model uh, building uh, channel where I will occasionally print things and build them. Which is what this is going to be because I have been going print crazy. Uh, ever since I've got the printer to snap to and act correctly um, with only a few mistakes. Uh, I have been printing like a madman and what it has resulted in a crap load of clutter so this week among other things I'm gonna be building a couple of shelving units small ones because I'm running out of space and I need space to put these new things that I've been making uh, luckily 3d printed objects if you print them correctly are not heavy uh, the, these resin things that I've been printing i have learning the uh, ins and outs literally of hollowing things and when you hollow them, they are very light. It's just that they take up space. And I can put them on a shelf, put a bunch of them on a shelf, put the shelf on the wall, and not worry about it crashing down. So that's going to be one of the jobs this week. Uh, amongst everything else is I've got quite a few of these things that I have printed. I have, you know, maybe cleaned the parts up. And then I stopped. I lost interest. Or I found something more interesting to print. And, uh, you know, I got, a, I got a buttload of unfinished stuff. So I'm going to be going through and uh, finishing some of these things that I've been printing that have been taking up space. And, time permitting, I'm going to finish this second shuttle. Now see, I can hold this up in front of me. I couldn't the other on the other one because the base is so heavy. But this is, you know, mostly done except for the fact that I want to put some lights in it. I've seen a lot of really great people's builds out there that have put lights on theirs. And I've got some circuits from Elliot Brown that I want to use on here. I've got a strobe circuit that I've never used. I think I want to put a strobe on the roof and on the belly. Um, I want to put marker lights on the nacelles. All kinds of stuff. So uh, it's going to be one of those potpourri weeks. So sit down, grab a cup of your favorite, and uh, join us on what I don't even know how this is going to turn out. I don't even know what the shape of the week to come is because I'm, I'm in one of those things where I've got 90 million things I need to do and I just need to have someone tell me stop do this do that and do that because left to my own devices I won't get any of it done including this you can hear me procrastinating so let me uh, stop drop and roll and take you to the table where I can show you what I'm working on Okay, say hello to Rosie. You recognize Rosie. Rosie from the Jetsons. This is what I have been working on. I found this great 3D file. Don't ask. I'm not going to put out file links. Do a Google search like I did. Just do Google search Rosie STL files or Rosie 3D print and you will find it. Uh, I believe this one was on the Cults 3D website. I highly recommend but uh, uh, I'm not going to be answering questions all day about where I got these things. Do some research. Um, but here's I learned a lot on this. A, never print solid things that are this big. Example, these arms are printed solid. Now they come in parts, obviously. Well, not obviously, you don't know. Uh, the, these are made up of quite a few parts. And tell, let me tell you, I have printed some of these multiple times to get them to come out right because of things I didn't know or things I learned. It's all a, a learning process for me. Uh, this was designed for filament printing in individual colors. That's why you will see pieces brought out like this. Uh, a lot of times I've noticed the, uh, the uh, resin printer files, they will already have the parts combined because you know they know you're not printing different colored resins. You're printing, you want to print it as simply as possible and you want to have it already hollowed out which is something else I uh, had to learn. As I said, I've printed these pieces multiple times. This piece 
is a bear if you print it solid. You know, you never want to do that. Uh, the first thing I needed to learn, which I still am working on, is the metric system. Uh, I went to school in the 60s and 70s where they taught you, by God, English measurements of inches, pounds, and feet, and things like that. None of this millimeters and microns nonsense. So, when I started seeing results coming out of the printer, I realized I had to back up and rethink because this takes up a heck of a lot of resin if you don't print it hollow, plus it deforms and all that kind of stuff. Again, this is not going to be a 3D printing channel. But I've got the parts printed out, finally. I've got parts put together. I've been experimenting on, uh, on um, paint colors. And i got to tell you, this is what made me choose resin over filament, is look how smooth these surfaces are right out of the printer. Now, this has had maybe one or two coats of uh, primer uh, on it. But right out, of the, right out of the gate, very few, if any, layer lines. And, uh, you know, not nearly a tenth of the sanding that you will need to do if you were printing this with filament. Now, I will say that if you look at Rosie's head, you can see, if you look closely enough, you can see where it's kind of segmented. It's not a, it's not a true cylinder. That kind of works. In, of course, this was in the file. This was baked into the file. Um, now that her, her bonnet, eyes, and mouth are, and the sides of her head, actually, were all different files that I had to put together. But the basic cylinder has facets to it which kind of work in this atmosphere because it's a robot you could believe that might be bent metal or whatever so i'm not i'm not giving any qualms about the um low the low poly rate i guess that would be on that make up this cylinder i did notice one thing that was bugging me after i painted this and put it together is that the mouth was bugging me i went back and checked some better references and this mouth is almost completely wrong so if i can't chip this piece out uh and rework it then you may see me reprinting this whole head nice thing about it is i could just simply pop it off and pop a new head on here but uh what i want to do is finish construction and get this all painted up and done today the um the tricky thing about this is because rosie basically is wildly wildly top heavy this is the little wheels that part that go under here the way this is designed is that she's holding a uh, dustpan and a broom in front of her and that is to give you stabilization to stand up because by the time you put all of this on those tiny wheels it becomes very unwieldy <laughs> wheels unwieldy um, but it's meant to go with something like this. Oops, it helps if, it, if I'm back in camera. This dustpan sits out front and she kind of rests on the dustpan. And that is because we need something to hold the weight up. Okay, so I was able to chip that mouth part back out. And what I'd like to do is obviously paint that black inside. But very simply put a uh, little plate in here to indicate the top of her uh, what she used as lips which were two plates that kind of came in and out um, it didn't have this raised edge around it that's that's what was bugging me it was an it was an inset from from the uh, outside of her cheeks so we're going to scratch build that now i treat 3d parts like this like i was building a uh, resin kit or building a garage kit I don't expect all the parts to be perfect. I expect there to be uh, divots to clean up. Anybody who's ever built a resin model knows there will be, you know, may, there might be an air bubble that you have to take care of, or it might be a thin spot or a, a bit, a flat plane that has a scratch in it that you might have to re-sculpt. So I'm treating them like that. I'm not expecting perfection to come out of the printer. I'm expecting good raw materials to come out of the printer. But see here you go you can see the how the the bow in the back is keyed in here and if you print all of these or as many pieces as you can at the same time 
then you know you're getting them off of the same printer, the same batch of resin, the same build plate, all of that at the same time. So if anything, particularly parts that need to fit in together, if you're worried about any sort of resin shrinkage, which does happen, uh, you can be assured that they are, everything is shrinking at the same rate. Now these were printed at two separate times, off of two, on two separate days, and yet they still fit like a glove. So there's no, absolutely no seam work that needs to be done there. And because I could paint this off separately, I don't have to worry, or paint the, the, the uh, apron separately, I don't have to worry about masking it in place. I can simply print it, paint it, and put it aside like that. I could even, if I wanted to, put a semi-gloss finish on this, which I think I will, and then you have the flat of the material showing up against the semi-gloss of the robotic body. Again, something you might not think about doing, being that this is a cartoon character and you're painting it with kind of real-world aesthetics. Um, see, let me see. By the time you get the arms and everything on it, it's actually a quite, quite nicely sized piece. Uh, again, that's where I had to, to learn my learn my metric system so I could have figured out precisely how big this was going to be before I started printing it so let's see oh and the ever iconic uh, antenna I come out of both sides let's see what's the next bit um, I need to paint up these arms so I can take the side, take the heavy arms off to the side, and if I ever want to, you know, make another one of these, I've got the files. It's no problem. Go, you know, I recommend you go out and get your own files and print it. I could print it smaller. I could print it larger. It's uh, it's really opened up a new world as far as modeling goes because you don't have to stick with what would be a one thirty second scale model or a one twenty fourth. If you want it a little bit bigger because your shelf space can handle it then by gum and by golly you can print it larger just make sure that you are printing all the pieces that you need at that same percentage or else you're going to find yourself in a world of woe wondering why you why your parts don't fit yeah she looks better already uh all i want to do at this point is let that dry for a bit and then come back in and put a top tooth in and that is the same color as the uh rest of the body so uh, I will have to paint that and put it in place I think I would be better off painting that outside and then cutting it the size and putting it putting it in there so let's do that let's see here's my specially mixed up body color uh, I might need to run out and pick up another color to go with that let's see well, I'm in a bit of a holding pattern right now. I've got uh, pieces that are painted but need to dry. I've got things in the printer that won't be ready for hours. I've even gone outside and cut together and glued up a lot of the woods for the shelves that I'm going to be working on this week, and that glue is drying. So while I'm, while I'm in a holding pattern, I don't want to pick up something else and start it. I want to... Uh, Take you all on the way. Take you all in a trip on the wayback machine uh, to a time long ago. I don't know how long ago it was precisely, but it was so long ago that all the evidence I have of it is physical. Are physical photos, not camera, not uh, iPhone photos, not digital images, but actual, honest to God, you had to take a picture and then send it someplace to get it developed. Um, and then get it back and hope your pictures uh, turned out. That's how long ago it was. This it was a trip to the Air and Space Museum. Now I go there as often as I can. Back in a day when you could still easily go to a museum. Uh, but I went to the Air and Space Museum for their Star Trek exhibit. Now they had in this Star Trek exhibit many costumes, uh, many props, original series props. Not so much next gen. It was all original stuff. That might even be that might even tell you how old it was. I don't think there was next gen stuff there yet. Um, 
it was right right about the time after uh, Undiscovered Country had come out because they had the Qonos One there. They had it mounted on the wall next to the original uh, D7 from the series. The refit was there. Their, of course, their 11-foot uh, original Enterprise was there. It still had the horrible green paint on it. Um, it was, like I say, it was mannequins with costumes and uh, original props and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things they had was the filming miniature for the shuttlecraft. It wasn't the, it wasn't the big shuttlecraft. That was still rusting away in a barn somewhere at the time. But here is a picture that I took. It's actual picture. It had to be developed by a person. That's how old this is. See, even the compressor is amazed. Uh, but it tells you something, and, and it brings up a question that I've been getting, and that was: Is the bottom of my is the bottom of my uh, Galileo too dark? Well, you, know, you can look at it in that light and say, yeah, maybe it is painted too dark. But then look at this. This is the original. I got to try to do this without the glare. I want you to see the contrast between the bottom and then the cells and the top. Now, also, I want you to recognize that this has a lot of flash on it. There's a lot of flash going on because the lettering on the side of the shuttle, which should be black, is not. So that tells you how bright, how overexposed this is. So if you can imagine that the gray is that dark against the uh, top when this picture is overexposed, you can imagine what it would be like in real life. Now, the reason why these are overexposed, at the time, I don't know if anybody else out there who went to this display would remember, it was mighty dark. This, ceil this dark blue ceiling up here, it was mighty dark, uh, not uh, not that well lit. So you had to kind of like put, make sure your flash was on your camera and all of that to make sure you get any sort of pictures. Here you can see, there's the saucer of the original Enterprise with the window lights on. They even had power running to it. This was hanging from the ceiling. This was before it went to the, um, before it went to the gift shop. So that tells you, that might help gauge the age of it as well. But you can see where all of these were on uh, the mount, you can see the mounting rig there going into the back of the shuttle. And there's the mounting rig going to the, the I guess would be the starboard side of the refit. Um, I snuck up the steps that were roped off so that I could get a picture of the top of the saucer of the refit. It, that was one of the few pictures that came out, so I'm glad I took that chance. But I, br I bring all that up to to uh, show you that yes, there was a significant difference in the grays of the top and the bottom of the uh, of the shuttlecraft, the, the gray at the top and the gray at the bottom. But uh, you could tell by looking at that profile that the model makers at Round Two really got it right this time. One last shot I'll, I'll share from that same show. Um, I was hoping that the back of the pictures would have a date on them, but they don't. But here you see, there's your original Enterprise, there's your refit, there's Shuttlecraft, the Botany Bay, and over here you can see the Katinga in the case. Boy, having that thing down where you could see it in a case was really nice, but you can kind of get the idea how far up and away from people the ships were when they were mounted to the ceiling. weird angle for the shuttle to be sitting at anyway okay uh, taking out the old mouth and I put in some new lips I like that better I think that's uh, I think that's a little bit more in keeping certainly with the design original design of Rosie so uh, I like the width um, I think just one on the top is not enough uh, when she talked her they, they joined in the center uh, so the only option I would see would be to make them slightly narrower, but I, I like them. I like where they are. So let's glue these in and call it a day. Morning, it's Tuesday, and I'm confident we're going to finish up two of the projects for this week and maybe start something else. Uh, obviously, we're going to finish Rosie today, and then we're probably, I say probably, I know we're going to get those those uh, shell units finished 
if we don't get them painted. We probably will get them painted. We don't, may not get them hung up today, but I know we'll get them painted. So here's where we are on Rosie, and I really need to get the five minute epoxy out because I've been going round and round on these arms and every time I hold them up I end up smudging paint somewhere so what I need to do is go ahead and glue them in place so that that can be holding the arm where it is and I could be painting what is still visible I need to go ahead and put these much lighter weight arms than the original uh, prints were and then I can get a, uh, a a good satin coat on this, maybe even a gloss. Probably a, eh, a satin coat will be good enough. But then I can touch up the paint where it's still visible. So let's take care of getting the arms glued on. Uh, repainted the I've repainted the head. I've got to uh, paint the red on the eyes, the Terminator eyes, because you know, back before there was a Terminator. This was your uh, this was your killer robot from the future. So let's do that. Stop jawing about it. Get on with it. I need a little piece of plastic here to uh, whip up some epoxy on. Use the real fast. Oh well, you know what? Let's just get out the one minute epoxy. No, no, five minute epoxy. One minute epoxy is a valuable thing because. It has those little uh, tubes. It's like a syringe, and it. Uh, I shake this like it's thin enough to move. Um, the one minute epoxy comes in those syringes, and those syringes are like pretty much a one use thing. And I, I have to be very careful when I break those out because I want to have everything that I'm going to put on the one minute epoxy and have that ready to go. This gives me, obviously, because it's five minute epoxy. Gives me a little bit more setup time. Okay, so we got that. Let's pull the pull the head out here. I think it might be worth it might be worth doing a little bit of sanding. Nah, I was thinking sanding the paint just where the I can do some scraping here. Just where it's gonna attach so that I know it's attaching to bare resin and not to paint. I probably should have done this before I mixed up the epoxy because we are on a timer with that now. I'll do it real quick. It's not going to set up that quickly. But now that I've got some bare, bare resin showing here. It actually gives me a nice, since we're going through many, many layers of paint, it's going to give me a uh, pocket of... Okay. Stop talking. Not talking now. Stop the talking. Okay. Get a little bit... Oh, I know what I need. I need a big old rubber band. Big old rubber band to uh, put around here when the arms are in so that they will hold, hold them in place. Okay, so we're done with that one. And these arms are at weird angles, I admit. And I think it has more to do with the weight displacement on the sculpture because... Like I said before, in order to make this top-heavy subject even stand up, you had to position the uh, dustpan. Oh, there goes that rubber band. Okay. Uh, me, I could just hold it like this for a, a bit. But the, uh, the arms had to be at a weird angle so as to um, make a tripod to take up the heavy weight of the body. Oh, and a, look at that. I should have mapped that out better because I'm seeing where I just peeled the paint off. Okay, well, I paint touch-up paint is for everybody. It's also day two of the uh, shelving unit uh, construction, and I just wanted to mock up something here to show you what's going on. These are the bits that I made yesterday. I just took some one-half by, uh, or actually three-eighths, by six material that I picked up at the local big box store and some quarter round and I made up a bunch of uh, shapes like this 
clamped them together, glued them up, and let them sit overnight. And when you put them all together, they spell mother. Uh, when you put them all together, they look something like this. This, the reason I use the quarter round is it gives me more area here. It reinforces the corner and gives me more area to glue. And I'm going to use a little pin nailer just to, just to uh, zot these together. But the glue is going to do the big holding. I am noticing from Flint and mocking this up this morning that the first thing I need is I need to run out and get a couple more of these. Now, this is how I this is how you amass a tool collection. You never want to start a tool collection by going out and buying every you know every stinking tool in the world because a you'll go broke and b chances are you'll never use half of them. So what I do is I look at a project and I say what kind of tools do I need to finish that project? Well, uh, you know sometimes. You start out needing, I'm going to need a big uh, cutoff saw, a big chop saw. So, you know, that's a big purchase. You want to make sure you're going to be doing enough to warrant that. But when it comes to small things like clamps, it's like, well, I only need two clamps for this per for this job. And then the next job I might need four clamps. Well, rather than going out and buying ten clamps to start with, I just generally get them as I need them. And then the next thing you know, you turn around and you've got... A nice collection of uh, clamps so the first thing I want to do is uh, uh, run out to the big box store get a couple more of these 12 inch clamps and uh, then come back and set up the uh, compressor with the pin nailer and there you go there are my two new shelving units now they would probably get me kicked out of any sort of uh, woodworking competition but you know you put enough coats of black paint on them and they'll do what they need to do that's all I ask of a shelf is that it does what it needs to do it's not pretty uh, I prefer to think of it as kind of a sculpture in progress but uh, if you're looking at the shelves and not what's on them then I have failed in my mission there you go first coat of black paint and they look better already I'll let that dry then come back and put a another coat on it and then let them dry overnight and tomorrow they should be ready to hang. Hanging's too good for them. Okay, while the uh, shelves are out in the noonday sun, it's beautiful out today. Oh, I should be, be sitting out on the deck with a beer, but I will bring my beer in with me. Um, but it, uh, the, the shelves have got their first coat of black paint that's drying. I'll go and hit that again uh, darn soon, as soon as that's had a good chance to dry. But uh, I'm going to come back here and work on Rosie for a little bit more. Now, I was planning on cutting some circle masks so that I could paint those eyes red. And then I looked over and realized I have red vinyl. Why don't I just cut the eyes, the circles, out of red vinyl and see how they look? Well, this is how they look. They look beautiful. I don't, they're shiny, which is nice. I don't have to... Uh, I don't have to fill up the airbrush and clean it all out. So I think this is what I'm going to go with. All I need to do now is take this back off. Don't worry, I've cut plenty of extras. Um, so that I can put the uh, finish on, which is going to be the semi-gloss. And then I'll come back and attach these after I have... Uh, oh, I stuck it over top. After I have... Um, let the uh, the uh, semi-gloss dry but what I want to do now before I spray it is put in her uh, side antennae uh, and I need to get a little bit of the CA out and that's the thing about working with this resin everything that you glue with this that has to do with this resin is CA it doesn't take any wimpy other glues you can't use 10x or MEK or testers or any of that stuff you got to use you got to use CA to glue this resin together, or epoxy, either one. Two-part epoxy is my go-to when I have the time because it's a stronger bond, it's a cleaner bond. But uh, uh, we're going to use the old CA. And uh, there were parts that you could print for these antenna, uh, for the rods. I chose not to. I thought I'd just you'd rather use a uh, bit of coat hanger. It's nice and straight. It's so one thing that doesn't print very well are uh, tiny or tiny things like uh, tiny shapes like the uh, antenna here that have to be straight or even. It's it's sort of like uh, 
you know, you can, if you can scratch build it, you should still scratch build it. Printing is a time consuming thing. It's a, it's a uh, resin consuming thing. It's not the answer for everything. If you can scratch build something, you're quicker, easier, cheaper to still scratch build it. Like I did the lips here. I wouldn't have printed those. Um, if there was a question of a, a ball or whatever. Now, these luckily were large enough that I could print those. But anything smaller than that, I probably would have used a googly eye or something. But there you go. Rosie and her antennae. Now I'll let that, let those set up. And then I'll hit this whole thing. I've got a mask or a painter's tape over top of her, uh, bonnet. Uh, what, what, I guess your tiara, whatever you would call that, a maid wears. Uh, I want to keep that flat white, so it's already painted flat white. I can go ahead and leave it that way, but paint all of this a uh, semi-gloss. And then I want to paint the body. All of this, all, everything here that's blue is going to be semi-gloss. That body is going to be semi-gloss, but the uh, her, her apron, her collar, her cuffs, and her bow, anything that's that fabric, I'm going to leave that flat. So, um, got my old, and this is something that the, uh, all these jugs of resin I've been getting come in boxes that have these inserts in them. So, I'm going to be well set for, uh, styrofoam for a while because every time I order another jug, I get another one of these and I've got a stockpile of them. So, all of this, this is not going to get, I think this will get flat coated. This will get semi glossed. This will get semi glossed. So I can go ahead and get that stuff ready to go. Flat, 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 and semi gloss. Oh, there's a couple other things I wanted to do. The um, it's true that Rosie has she has buttons going down her chest that are red. Now since this when this uh, door slot appears thank you sir when this door slot appears those buttons disappear so uh, I'm wondering if I want to put a button right above that just to give some red in her chest these accents on her arms are red those will need to be painted and of course this is the uh, uh, extension that goes out to the broom so I think I want to glue that in place before I uh, do the before I do the semi gloss coat, and I may even want to hit this whole thing with a dusting of the light blue before I semi gloss it. So, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Welcome back, friends. It is Wednesday. It's a glorious day, and I am busier than a one arm paper hanger in the middle of a typhoon. I guess I don't. I'm too busy to even come up with a good analogy. I've got like nine projects running around the house. Got the shelves up. I'll take you there in a second. Got the base painted for Rosie. I'm going to do the final construction. I'm going to epoxy everything down. She does need a base. So she, she, poor girl's not steady on her wheels. I can't trust her. So I'm going to uh, be pinning everything and epoxying everything. But we're going to start by uh, gluing her down to the base. And then we can get the... Uh, dustpan and everything lined up so uh, plus I had to uh, didn't have to I'm lucky enough to have gotten a huge order for uh, the first shuttlecraft masks yes look for those in your online shop of preference the shuttlecraft masks are a thing now so the first order of those are going out today and uh, putting Rosie together putting the shelves up putting the Oh, uh, at some point I need to cut the grass this week, so uh, it's it's uh, it's a frantic day, and a haircut and a shower and a shave is de desperately needed. And there's the final rosy. Everything is rosy since I met my rosy. Um, the epoxy has set up. I went out and left it around, left it alone. I got a haircut. Thank the maker. I needed it. Uh, but the epoxy is now set and she's nice and <coughs> steady on her wheels and uh, 
ready to take her place on the new shelf that has been made up for her. Welcome back everybody. It's Thursday and we're continuing our potpourri, potpourri week. And today is gold day. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, print for myself once I got a 3D printer was some of these one one to one size scale props that you know you can never afford to buy the real prop and they don't they're not gonna make a uh, no one's gonna make a garage kit of it you're never gonna find it any other way um, and, and a lot of these for some odd reason ended up being gold well you start off with your headpiece to the staff of Ra because you gotta have a headpiece to the staff of Ra and this is a readily available STL file it's a easy easy enough to find on any of the free all of these were free downloads I uh, I haven't even gotten into the realm of the paid download except for a couple of things that will happen later on this summer I think but um, or into fall really but the problem with gold is uh, finding a good gold to paint and I of course the first thing I went for was Duplicolor because I like Duplicolor for the rest of my I, I, I use Duplicolor for all my primers and uh, the car colors are great, so I figured the gold would be a one. It'd be a, a no-brainer. It'd be an easy, easy choice. Well, I I, I printed out. Uh, I can't even remember which one of these it was. I think it may have been the original, um, an original, maybe in this, an original uh, uh, holy hand grenade, and the gold was dull. It wasn't a great gold. You know, nowhere near this chrome look on this cap. Uh, and having had the uh, Still having the flashbacks to the, the uh, silver chrome on the dome of the uh, ET ship. I wasn't going to go down that road again. So if I couldn't find a good rattle can, then I was just going to make do. Well, I, like I said, I got the gold dupa color, and it wasn't that great. Uh, kind of expensive. Didn't really get out of it what I, what I thought. So I said, okay, well, that's going to be my lot in life. I'm not going to find a good gold. And as I was going through uh, the Lowe's and uh, getting some other supplies for something else, I saw the duplicate. I saw the uh, Rust-Oleum bright coat gold. Now Rust-Oleum, I've always turned my nose up at. I know people who have had really good results with Rust-Oleum primers. To me, Rust-Oleum has always seemed like a bargain brand. Um, just not, just not a high, a high quality paint. I don't know why. It's my own prejudice. I'm sorry. I think it's the term rust in the title. I don't know. So I figured I'd take it home and try it. Well, I don't, I don't mind telling you. I was pleasantly surprised. And this is not going to turn into a commercial for Rust-Oleum. But I got some very good results on my Montechiwan. This is sprayed. This is just plain prime now. Pay no attention to some of the printing defects in it. This was an early uh, experiment. But, uh, you know, a couple coats of primer. No sanding. Very, very little sanding on this. Um, this one, this particular, this particular print was uh, printed top half and bottom half. And uh, the seam work in the middle is, is, is not good. That's my fault. I also made the mistake of putting it too close to the edge of the print bed in the front of his belly got cut off. But rather than scrap the whole thing, I figured I would just putty it together and use it as a, a learning tool. But I uh, sprayed that with a good coat of the, uh, the Rust-Oleum Gold and I was amazed at how good it turned out. So uh, I used that on everything. I started thinking of all the stuff that I had, that I had files for that, were go that was gold that I wanted to print. So I did the uh, headpiece to the staff of Ra, and I just printed that gold, came out beautiful, and I wiped it down with a, uh, took some regular old artist acrylic paints, uh, burnt umber and black, made a little slurry, slathered it over the, over the uh, headpiece, and then gave it a few seconds and wiped it down to give it this antique look. But that turned out pretty good, and of course I went on to the, uh, the uh, idol. Give me the idol, I'll give you the whip. Throw me the whip. Throw me the idol. Uh, that guy. Uh, again, these these can run very expensive for the high end props, and I wasn't. I wanted one, but I didn't want to spend a lot of money for one. That's that's where it comes down to it. Um, I'm, I would like to have this idol in my collection, just in the corner. If anyone spots it, and says, "Oh, that's the idol from from Raiders of the Lost Ark." I say, "Yes, you're right," but I I wasn't so invested in it that it had to be gold leafed. And it had to have the eyes, you know, the glass eyes in it and all that kind of stuff. 
good and close enough was good enough for me and that's to me the nature of a lot of this 3d printing is close enough is good enough and the nice thing about the uh, the, the resin over the filament is that you uh, do much 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 less sanding hardly any sanding and you and if you're going to do something that's gold or metallic finish you want something that's got a smooth surface because that's where you're going to see I mean it's going to lay down smoother if uh, there are no big print lines through it that you have to worry about so again this was got this would got uh, dirty down with some burnt umber and some black and wiped off and when I put it up on the shelf next to the headpiece they make a nice little conversation piece and uh, like I say it's close enough is good enough um, here is my original holy hand grenade and through errors in my own printing I made uh, mistakes in how it was oriented on the plate not neither here nor there and some of the beads did not print or they printed halfway and didn't print the whole way and that's why I come back to saying, you know, a 3D printer is not a replicator. If you can get good serviceable parts that need a little bit of cleanup, then you are in no further, you're no, it doesn't set you any further back than if you bought a resin kit that had parts that you had to clean. You never ever get a resin kit at a garage kit resin kit. I won't say never ever. You hardly ever get a resin kit from a garage kit maker where the parts are absolutely pristine and clean and you don't need to do anything to them. I can count on one hand the number of parts and those were the the uh, the commercially made uh, the, the the Officer Kane kit from Polar Lights that was um, the uh, res that was a resin kit very expensive but the parts came packaged in the bugle and that was ca you know, cast overseas and the parts came beautifully individually pocketed in foam and all that. that those parts did not need cleaning. Some of Tony's uh, stuff from the uh, Valley Forge did not need cleaning. Those were very good parts. But by and large, you will buy a resin kit. You will have to clean the parts. You'll either have to do some seam work or some puttying work or fill in bubbles or any of that kind of stuff. So I don't feel like I have been cheated in any way if something comes off the 3D printer and I have to patch it or I have to you know build up something that where a wall blew out or a detail got uh, didn't print correctly so what I did was take some one head uh, take this these pearls are the size of a pinhead or these glass uh, straight pins so all I did was nip them off and replace them with heads of the pins and I think it comes out completely serviceable so I, that was the first one I had printed. I didn't like particularly how the pin had turned out, so I wanted to print a second one. And uh, it prints fast, and, uh, not fast enough, but it printed quickly enough that I didn't, I could let it go overnight. Anyway, so I got, once I got this new gold, it's like, well, let me see how that looks on a, on a holy hand grenade. And I gotta tell you, that looks darn good. I mean, that's all sm one smooth, one smooth shape and the gold paint really really looks good on this so i would would not hesitate to recommend that anybody who is in the market for painting anything in gold uh the rust-oleum and it's about half the price of the duplicolor but rust-oleum gold over a nice uh gray primer does the trick and I've got one more thing that I wish to print and wish, wish I wish to paint in gold and that is this badge for uh, the Wrath of Khan style uniform style Enterprise or Star Trek badge. I printed this is one of the first things I printed back when I was still using the this black resin and I gotta tell you this black resin between this badge and these chairs was all that was all it was good for. Uh, I, I much prefer the, the the gray resin it's just like uh, working with gray vinyl or, or gray um, models. You're going to end up painting it gray anyway. Start with something gray. Uh, I know I'm rambling, but now that, of course, the weather is crappy out today, so I don't know how well this is going to paint. But as my uh, project for today, I'm going to put some primer on this and then paint it gold and then go in and lay in some detail on top of it. And then we'll have a nice badge. 
but I wanted to show you the uh, the gold collection. This was the the good Mondachi one that printed, and I am working on uh, putting texture in, and putting some bronzes and some and some coppers and painting the rest of the detail in on this. And uh, let's see, it's Thursday. Hmm. I might get to the shuttlecraft today. I don't know. I've got a lot of. Uh, I've got a big order to put out again today. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a week of uh, plotting orders and getting things out. So it's been a uh, a hectic week, a busy week. A uh, I'll got the shelves up. I'll, I'll when I do my wrap up tomorrow. I will show you the finished shelves with the uh, objects on them. But those were up. I put those up yesterday. Uh, I'm glad I got the uh, the uh, painting and the construction on those shelves done at the beginning of the week because now we're coming into the tail end of uh, Hurricane Sand uh, Sally and um, the storms that are being spun off of that. It's supposed to rain all day today and most of tomorrow. So uh, I know you didn't call in to see the weather to get a weather report, but uh, that's that's the that's the latest so here's the here's the school of gold figures and there you go hey i got today's project out here in the dining room because the plotter is plotting in the uh, studio and that means uh a very loud working environment but i've got a couple coats of the filler primer on the badge looks pretty good now I'm going to hit it, uh, step out the back door and hit this very quickly and then come back in because it is raining off and on. But I'm going to try the, uh, the Rust-Oleum Gold on uh, the badge. And I think the secret is to take it in a couple of gradual coats, not try to do it all at once. That's one, the first quick spraying and, and boy, I can already see the uh, improvement. I'll let this dry. The nice thing about this Rust-Oleum is it also dries fairly quickly. so. Uh, we're gonna let this sit for a bit and then come back and flip it around and hit the spots I didn't get the first time. Because I don't have enough things going on, I've got uh, an order plotting here. I'm working on this. I'm getting ready to start up the 3D printer to uh, put out another uh, object there. So uh, why not? I've got everything going. I am uh, working on lighting for the shuttlecraft and I'm making up a box for the headlights and because I don't have to worry about fitting an interior in this kit. I can make it big and bulky and take up as much space as I want to. The nice thing about that is I can bring the lights further back from the, uh, bring the LEDs further back from the opening here. And that's going to uh, stop the, hopefully stop that problem with the heat building up because I won't be jamming a, a console right up against it. I can give it lots of air and uh, room to breathe. And the next thing to do will be to build a box for the uh, blue lights. I pulled those out. They're here somewhere. Where did they go? Here they are. Here's a strip of blue LEDs that I'm going to put in here just like I did before. So I need to uh, cut some plastic for that. A moment of relative quiet when only one of the machines is running to show you the latest uh, work on the shuttle lighting. Uh, still haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to power this thing because if I'm going to put it on a battery then I need to make a hatch that's openable that I can get to the battery and change it when I want. But here is the lighting. Anyway, put, turn the camera up so you can see it. There you go. There's the blue lighting and turn it there you go. Now you can see it. And now you can see the, uh, the box that I've made that goes up against that with the fiber fill and the parabola shape of plastic with a blue light uh, blue uh, strip LED in there quite effective again uh, taking things you learned on the one build and apply it to the next so it just kind of fits in there slots in nicely and it's not again not horribly bright and that's the lesson I'm liking that these lights don't have to be uh, you know they don't have to be blinding so um, yeah I need to figure out the best way if I make this if I made the uh, bottom door if I made that ooh now see I could make that bottom just the bottom hatch just that openable 
to where I could put a battery and the switch right in there. I think that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm just going to make a box because the hinges on this piece still work. I didn't break this like I did the, uh, the other one. So that still works. I think I can make a box to uh, slide a 9 volt in and out of that bottom door. Welcome back kids, it's Friday. Welcome back to Happy Acres. It's the last work day of the week and we're going to do some shuttle lighting today. I don't know how much we'll get done, but by gum and by golly we will do our best. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure I had area up here where the headlights are. Had that nice and blacked out because uh, you don't want, you want four individual lights shining there. You don't want to see uh, the light leaks up there. So now that that's had a chance to dry, I need to pull off those circle masks and uh, basically glue this guy in place. That's just a nice big old uh, box made with a strip lighting in there. So let me find my Exacto and we'll get on with the show. We've got four very well defined window or uh, headlights in there now. So let's go ahead and glue in the uh, the box here. I probably should shove it in there and then just smoosh some epoxy in and around it to get it all nice and seated. Once it's in there, it looks something like that. Okay, now that that's tacked in place, I uh, hit the power to it and the lights do wonderful things. Okay, next stop. Uh, now that that area is uh, fixed up, I can go ahead and put the rest of this battery box in. I was really wanting to do that yesterday, but then I realized I would have that would close off my area as far as working on the uh, um, front headlights. Oh, and I did this thing up this morning. I had the windows blacked out before, but I was reminded that you know the windows when they were not open were hull colored. So now I've got a hull color on this side, and if I want to change it, I can change it out and make it the black ones next time. So all it is is taped in place from the inside. Okay, the uh, intermittent flashing lights you see in front of you are not an illusion. They are from the fertile mind and nimble fingers of Elliot Brown. And uh, he has sent this, uh, he sent this homemade circuit to me once and I swore I would use it. Well, I found the perfect use for it. It's hooked up to two strobe lights. It's not a fader. It's, it's, there's a subtle difference between something that, fa or something that flashes and something that strobes. And this is sent to be a strobe. And I'm going to put one of them on the belly here of the shuttle. And the other will go on the roof on the center. So you will have one on the top and one on the bottom that will uh, flash in unison. And that's the important thing. You could get just flashing LEDs, but pretty soon they're going to go out of sync and it's not going to look right. So uh, we're going to making, I'm making my way from the front to the back here. I've got the box put in for the battery. Um, now I'm putting in the uh, circuit board and the, see this is the power that's going to the windows up for the headlights. And then I will do the same and then I will join all of these power wires up together. I've got plenty of room and then this is the box that goes in the back. So the only other thing beyond all of this is are the lights that will go into the nacelles and that'll be the next big trick once I get these guys mounted. Okay, I took a couple minutes to add a plug to the light that goes on the roof because I just, as much work as I've got left to do, I can't have the roof just, you know, flapping on the breeze around here. So now I can go ahead and epoxy that bulb down and then I can plug it into the roof or plug it into the rest of the wiring and when I get ready to attach it. So now that it's safe and out of the way, I can get back into the rest of the circuits. And I need to uh, glue the, the backlight in. I gotta make sure I'm happy with that before I glue it in. Let me uh, throw some voltage at it again and check the brightness of it. Not that there's much that I can do at this point, but uh, just to make sure everything is still working. Okay, we've got a nice blue glow there. That's ready to go in the back. And I will uh, spot tack that in place with some CA and then I'll go around all of this with uh, one minute epoxy. Like I said, that one minute epoxy has a one minute uh, usable time so I need to make sure I've got all of my connections ready to go first. 
You're running into a slight electrical issue that I'm sure Elliot has the answer to. Um, but what happens, and I know it's a amperage issue, is that when I hook everything up at the same time to the same battery, um, when the strobe goes off, it dims the other lights slightly. Now, I noticed it, it happens a lot less on a fresh battery than it does on an old battery, so that's telling me that it's probably a amperage issue. But I would like still to uh, run all this on one single battery, so um, without... If, if it continues to be a problem, because I haven't even added the nacelle lights yet, if it continues to be a problem, I will isolate Elliot's circuit and put it on its own battery. But uh, right now, I really wish that wasn't happening. Okay, onward. Okay, I've got the uh, front of the nacelles ready. Pardon the uh, shaky uh, light source. But uh, that's basically a white a dome that's been painted white on the inside. Packed with fiber fill. Um, 1.8. I think that's a 1.8. Uh, bulb stuck in the back and uh, now I just need to uh, put this in the oops put this in the front of the nacelles okay we have our first look at the nacelle with again sorry about the shaky battery but uh, the red nav light and that will go on this side so I just need to glue everything together and solidify it now and here is the starboard in the cell with the green light on the top of it um, these are going very well but before I go any further uh, I need to finish up an order and run it to the post office and then I can come back and add these nacelles to the rest of the ship okay I'm almost ready to close this up I've got my door here with the switch just inside. I've got the battery box where I can slide the battery in and out if I need. I want to reinforce that switch just a little bit. But the last thing to do before I touch up the paint is to plug the ceiling panel in. slide it on. Boy, it's nice not having this interior in here where you can just take all the room you need to put some lights in. Come on. We've been through this dance before. Slide it in the slot. Push it forward. There you go. Push it forward. Make sure everybody's in their slot and happy. Oops, you need to come up some. Where's my hook? Get my hook out. Here we go. Everything's in the slot. Put the last piece in here in the back to key it in place. Now all we know. All we need now is to touch up the paint. Turn off the lights, open the door, hit the switch, close the door back up. Headlights, nacelle lights, running lights for nacelle, strobe on the top, strobe on the belly, Nice blue light in the back. I've got some touch-up paint and decals to do, but uh, I'm going to call this done for the purposes of the video. And then uh, over the weekend, I will put in the uh, put the decal, those three tiny decals on, and um, I have to touch up the dark gray paint. And the last thing I need to do would be to uh, hit it with the clear coat. So, uh, close enough 
for purposes of the video. It is the time that I normally shut down for the afternoon on a Friday. So uh, I guess I need to gather in. Let me go gather in the bits that I finished this week so I can make a nice collective picture. Okay, so I think the first thing I need to show you is how these shelves turned out. There is there's Rosie and the Montesquins and the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch and the Genie Bottle. Now, I have sent for specific instructions on how to paint the Genie Bottle and those are, should be coming in next week. And uh, once that happens, that will be a uh, subject. I don't know whether it's next week's build or coming up in the weeks to come, but I think rather than pull everything off into the other room, I'll just show, show, you, show them to you out here. Oh, this was how, by the way, this was how the badge turned out. That's the, that's the badge. This is on a mannequin. The, uh, this is how the costume badge turned out. That's how the printed badge turned out. And I think that's a lot cleaner and neater uh, of a thing. So uh, take that. Here is the, the, I think this is a Roddenberry.com badge. This is actually metal. Uh, but even that is a little smaller yet, uh, yet again, than the ones that uh, I printed. So here is the Holy Hand Grenade. Here are a couple of Mondachuans. And I will, uh, I still have to finish painting on him. So uh, that may be the subject of next week. But Rosie is done. She's up there next to her boyfriend, the B9. Uh, see, G bottle. Here we are on the other side. I have an empty space here to fill. Isn't that fun? But there's the uh, headpiece, of the staff of Ra, and the uh, fertility idol from Raiders. And I was able to rearrange some stuff over in this in this uh, display area to put things up on shelves. I moved piece off of that shelf into there and Elvira sits up nicely on the top of that shelf. Uh, part of what, what, what I like to do is when I'm getting new shelves up is it just declutters everything. And here's a last look at the shuttle. Oops, let's get it so you can see it. A last look at the shuttle with the lights, uh, lights ablaze on it. Again, belly strobe roof strobe um, some touching up with the paint yet to do but there is the uh, with the green running light with the white nacelle and the red running light with the red nacelle bottom door opens I may want to put something behind here that lights up these two windows but put my little pinky in here turn off the light I think I'm going to put a magnet on that door to keep it shut too. And that finishes the second, second shuttle. And that, dear friends, is where we're going to finish for this week. Uh, it was a busy week. Boy, I need this weekend off, I got to tell you. Uh, did a ton of little things. You saw all the stuff that I got done on the shelves. I got the shelves done. Uh, Rosie got done. Uh, finished up the hand grenade. Finished up the Raider stuff. Finished working on, started working on the Montague ones. Got the lighting in this important little doodad. Um, and as a hint of things to come, say hello to my little friend. Well, let's see if I can get him to wave. Hello, little friend. Hello. Uh, I'm finding all kinds of neat stuff on the, on the internet to print. This is going to be a fun build. Going back to some classic roots here. You gotta make that noise, I'm sorry. Um, and that, I've got other exciting things, complete models that I want to completely, uh, every single part, sort of like Rosie, uh, download all the parts, print all the parts, and put it together. Cannot uh, wait to get started on some of that now that I can get semi reliable uh, uh, results out of the printer. I'm not fighting it tooth and nail like I was to get results. So uh, until next week when who knows what, what, what we'll be working on. Y'all be safe, be good, be good to each other. Uh, take care of one another and we'll see you here next week.